In high school, I was a state champion. My competition doubted me because of my size. My family and friends were scared about me joining the Marines. At 21, my body was torn apart by an enemy hand grenade. I had to be resuscitated in the medevac helicopter. Upon arriving at Camp Bastion, I was labeled PEA. Patient expired on arrival. I flatlined at Walter Reed. People always assumed I was in a motorcycle wreck. My response to them, no, Taliban. completed a mud run, and jumped from a plane. I won't ever quit. I am just getting started. An effective leader doesn't uh, say, okay, we gotta get from point A to point B, and we're probably gonna get shot at a lot. Y'all go ahead. A good leader, by the time he has it out of his mouth, he's already on the way, and you're right there, right? Step, step behind him. Sergeant Robert H. McCard. So we're going to go over uh, uh, like purpose and history of Medal of Honor, um, kind of like take you through like how it was uh, put into effect uh, by President Abraham Lincoln. Uh, we're going to go over uh, our recipient, Gunnery Sergeant McCard, um, and his qualifications to get the award. Uh, we're going to go over lessons from his actions, and we're going to talk a little bit about his legacy. <coughs> Uh, so the Medal of Honor is awarded for such non-commissioned officers and privates as shall most distinguish themselves by their gallantry in action and other soldier-like qualities during the present insurrection uh, by Abraham Lincoln. And so uh, Lincoln signs this into law in 1862, and it's only for the Army at this point. But in 1863, it becomes a permanent decoration for the Army, and then later, uh, on March 3rd in 1915, he expands it to all branches. So before the Medal of Honor, the Navy had... Uh, the Medal of Valor, which is a little bit similar to the name. Alright, so our recipient, Gunnery Sergeant Picard, Robert H. Picard, uh, he was a member, or he was the platoon sergeant of the 4th Tank Battalion and the 4th Marine Division uh, during the Battle of Saipan uh, in the Pacific. It's a little bit east of the Philippines, uh, I believe, um, so it's kind of on the uh, farther end of the Battle of the Pacific. Uh, so, <coughs> what happened? Uh, for Gunnery Sergeant McCart's tank division is his tank was disabled by uh, 77 millimeter Japanese artillery, and uh, but, but the weapons were still working. So he was able to bore his weapons on the enemy and still maintain his fire. So if you think like the movie Fury, like if you seen that last scene with Brad Pitt, the tank, yeah, I'm serious, like this is exactly what it is. Like they get disabled and they're there and they have to fight off like this massive horde of Germans basically, except in this case, yeah. Uh, so anyway, the Japanese fire gets like insanely intense, and he has to order his crew to retreat. So uh, he orders his crew out of the tank, and to cover uh, his crew, he stays in the tank while they leave, and starts hurling grenades at the enemy, like all the grenades they have, until their supply is exhausted. Uh, so while he was doing this, he gets mortally injured, uh, but then he he didn't stop there, because his, uh, all, his, all his crew members were not out of safety yet. And so what he does is he, dis he disassembles uh, the machine gun on the tank and picks it up and starts firing at the Japanese. So that's pretty motivating. Um, so then uh, he kills, according to his crew, 16 enemies before uh, the Japanese killed him at age 26. It's so not, not much older than you guys. Uh, so a few lessons we can learn from uh, Gunnery Sergeant <coughs> was he uh, had no hesitation to help others before himself. <coughs> Uh, he also uh, took command and gave orders resolutely. 
Uh, he didn't even have to think twice. His crew didn't hesitate to obey what he had to say. And then uh, lastly, after being wounded, he was committed to finishing his mission, even though you know, he had suffered some pain. And uh, he wanted to help them save, or save his crew's life. Uh, so obviously a little bit more insignificant here. Um, you guys have to face these kind of lessons learned every day when you're going through your life as a midshipman. Uh, like without hesitation helping others, you guys could, you know, maybe someone needs a ride from PT, you know, something as simple as that. Um, and just without hesitation helping them out, you know, giving them whatever they need. Uh, so then um, also taking command and giving orders resolutely. So for me in mechanical engineering, we have a lot of group projects. And uh, it's, uh, it's pretty easy to step up and just say, hey, just make a plan. Uh, for the most part, people respect that. Uh, and lastly, um, you know, after getting a bad grade, maybe on a test or something like that, it's easy to quit. It's easy to just give up, maybe drop a class or something like that. But it's also, you know, it's the harder and it's going to be a better way, better ending for you if you just stick with it and improve your grade. So uh, the legacy uh, left behind by Gunner Sergeant McCard. Um, so he was awarded the Medal of Honor by President Roosevelt uh, after the war, and then. And then uh, the DD uh, 822, a gearing class destroyer, was named after him. After that, which was decommissioned, I think, in 2000. So, uh, so we went over uh, the purpose of the Medal of Honor and some of its history. Uh, we went over his recipient, uh, Gary Sergeant McCard, his qualifications, uh, and some lessons learned from his actions and his legacy. Uh, any questions? Here are my references. Thank you. All right, good afternoon, Battalion. So today I'll be presenting the actions of Lieutenant J.G. Clyde Everett Lassen, which took part on the 19th of June in 1968, earning him the Congressional Medal of Honor. Lieutenant J.G. Lassen was born on the 14th of March in 1942 in Fort Myers, Florida, and he was a member of the Helicopter Support Squadron 7, primarily doing search and rescue missions off of the Vietnam coast. He flew the Kamon SH-2A Sea Sprite helicopter and was stationed on the USS Crows. Lieutenant Lassen and his air crew were asleep when a flight of three F-4 Phantom II jets took off from the USS America. This is a squadron mate. Uh, jet of one of the three, the, the flight of three. Lieutenant Commander John Claw Holtzclaw and Lieutenant Commander John Zeke Burns were in control of one of the jets and they were able to evade two SA-2 surface-to-air missiles but unfortunately were hit when a third missile detonated near the rear wing, rear right wing, causing the aircraft to become inoperable and they had to eject. They both luckily survived the ejection with relatively minor injuries. This is Lieutenant Lassen and his air crew. So from left to right, we have Lieutenant J.G. Lassen, aviation electrician's mate, second class Bruce Dallas, aviation machinist mate, third class Don West, and Lieutenant J.G. Leroy Cook. They were wheels up at 022 and arrived on scene at 0141. And on route, they could see the glow of the wreckage from more than 30 miles away. They were originally planning to pick up the downed air crew with the jungle penetrator, which can be seen here. But due to the high canopy covering on the hillside that the air crew were at, they were unable to because the helicopter was too heavy to hover. Lieutenant Lassen then ordered his crew to dump fuel and ammunition to lighten the load. <coughs> While this was happening, support aircraft were dropping flares to um, illuminate the position of the air crew. And while Lieutenant J.G. Lassen and his crew were getting in position, the flares went out, and Lieutenant Lassen actually collided with the tree, causing damage to both the horizontal stabilizer and the right side of the aircraft. During this time, they were engaged by enemy ground fire and returned fire with their MH-60 machine guns. He was able to recover, and he put the landing lights on of his aircraft to illuminate himself so the air crew could see which rice paddies he was about to land in. They landed in rice paddies several times, but were unable to pick up the downed air crew because of the North Vietnamese being in between the air crew and Clementine II. Finally, Lieutenant J.G. Lassen was able to hover above a rice paddy 
and pick up both Lieutenant Commander Holtzclaw and Lieutenant Commander Burns. He immediately climbed to 4,000 feet and he headed back to the USS Preble with 30 minutes of fuel remaining and while en route, the right cabin door fell off. And that was due to the damage from the tree hit. While en route back to the USS Preble, they were unable to, or they decided that they were unable to make it back to the, due to their low fuel shortage, so they headed to the USS Jouette, captain by Robert Hayes. And they landed with less than five minutes of fuel remaining in the fuel lines. For their actions, Lieutenant J.G. Clyde Everett Lassen was awarded the Medal of Honor. Lieutenant J.G. Leroy Cook was awarded the Navy Cross. And aviation electricians made Bruce Dallas and aviation machinists made Don West were both awarded the Silver Star. And this is a portion of Lieutenant J.G. Lassen's Medal of Honor citation, and it reads, for conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty as pilot and aircraft commander of a search and rescue helicopter attached to Helicopter Support Squadron 7. Lieutenant J.G. Lassen, he's on the far left, and he was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor by President Lyndon B. Johnson. He was the first naval aviator to be awarded the Medal of Honor during the conflict in Vietnam, and was only one of three to be awarded the medal during the entire war. He retired from the Navy as commander in 1982, and unfortunately he passed away in 1994 due to cancer, but in 2001 the U.S. Navy commissioned a ship in his honor aiming at the USS Lassen, and it is an Arleigh Burke class guided missile destroyer, DDG-82. Does anyone have any questions? All right, thank you. Good afternoon, Battalion. Good afternoon, Mr. King. Today I'll be talking to you about Lieutenant J.G. Albert David, who is a surface warfare officer uh, who received Medal of Honor uh, for his actions in World War II. First I'll be going over his military career and his background, and then I'll be going over what exactly he did to earn the Medal of Honor, and then we'll go over the importance of the actions that he took and stuff that we can hopefully take away from his actions. So <coughs> Lieutenant David actually enlisted in the Navy in 1919 at the age of 17, and over 20 years of service, he served aboard 10 ships, including different classes of battleships, cruisers, and destroyers. Uh, and then the same year that he actually transferred to the reserves, 1939, he was called back to active duty uh, due to the start of World War II. Uh, he was working with a submarine repair unit in 1942 in San Diego, and was given a commission uh, as an to, uh, to Ensign, and then was assigned to the USS Pillsbury, DE-133, uh, and was given a promotion to Lieutenant Junior Grade in 1943. Aboard the USS Pillsbury, he served as the Assistant Engineering and Electrical Office. So during World War II, uh, German U-boats were the biggest threat to Allied ships uh, pretty much destroying any shipping vessels that would be going from the Americas to Europe and any and along with warships. And so hunter-killer task groups were formed uh, to combat the threat of German U-boats. So in May of 1944, Task Group 22.3 was formed, and it was based around the USS Guadalcanal, which is a light carrier escort ship, and included five destroyer escorts, one of which was the USS Pillsbury. Lieutenant David Shield. So in the morning of June 4th, 1944, one of the destroyer escorts that was in the task group confirmed a sonar ping off the west coast of Africa as a German U-boat, U-505, that they had been hunting. And so with the help of uh, aircraft who could see the ship, see the sub from above, uh, depth charges were dropped by the destroyer escorts. And when one of these depth charges damages U-505, it was forced to surface right in the middle of Task Group 22.3, and they were immediately met with gunfire, so the German crew was ordered by their commander to abandon ship. Now, when this order was given, the German crew was supposed to scuttle the ship so it wouldn't be captured. Uh, 
by opening valves that would flood compartments and setting time explosives that would eventually sink the ship for good. Luckily, not all of this happened, and Lieutenant David was able to lead a boarding party of nine men to the sub, and without knowing what lied beneath, he went down the hatch uh, of the conning tower and attempted to take the, ship, the sub. They found that no Germans were left on board, and so he began directing the initial salvage operations and capturing different coding machines, uh, code books, messages, anything that would be of use to the Allies. And this included two Enigma machines, which was a big win for the Allies. And because of their efforts, uh, the U-505 was able to be towed back to the U.S. by the USS Guadalcanal. So the capture of U-505 was actually kept a secret until the end of the war. And this actually allowed the Allies to sink almost 300 more U-boats because we were able to decode messages from the Germans and find out locations and everything. And by the end of the war, the U-505 became the only submarine that was captured by the U.S. in either world war and was the first, the first boarding and capture of an enemy ship by the U.S. Navy since 1815. Uh, for this, Lieutenant David was awarded the Medal of Honor. Unfortunately, three weeks before he was supposed to be presented with it, uh, he died of a heart attack in Norfolk, Virginia. And so it was presented posthumously to his wife, Linda May David, uh, on October 5th, 1945, <coughs> by President Truman. Uh, his was the only Medal of Honor that was awarded in the Battle of the Atlantic during World War II. And later on, the USS Albert David DE-1050, another light destroyer escort ship, was named after him. So some takeaways. Uh, leading from the front is something that we're told all the time. Uh, but that's because it really is the best way to lead your sailors and marines. Uh, Lieutenant David went down into the conning tower without knowing what was beneath and began directing the salvage operations right alongside his, uh, his crew. And because of this, because he was right alongside them, they were probably much more willing to put forth the effort that they did uh, to save the sub. Uh, next is competence under pressure. When he went down in, he was a surface warfare officer. He had never been on a sub before. But when he went down into the sub, he was able to use what he knew and start directing operations to salvage the sub, make sure that no valves were left open so that no uh, compartments would flood, and uh, make sure that <coughs> there were no explosives left armed on board. Uh, and this just shows that. Um, under uh, any stressful situation, you need to stay calm and finish what you need to to complete the task. Uh, the next is commitment to the task at hand. This goes right along with it. Uh, when they went down into the sub, Lieutenant David actually ordered the closing of the hatch behind them, uh, just in case the sub did list uh, in any way that more water wouldn't come into the cell on top, and this just showed that he was very committed to saving it, and he would do whatever it took to do that. Uh, and because of his commitment to saving the sub, uh, we were able to capture all that equipment, and which eventually aided the Allies in the Battle of the Atlantic. And it shows that what you can accomplish, what you accomplish now, can lead to much greater effects uh, in the Captain, you midshipman, came to midshipman first class space. Do you know if he had like a personal firearm when he tried to go down to the hatch? I believe he had his whatever the standard issue like handgun they would carry with them because uh, the boarding party would definitely have small Thanks, arms with them. Uh, but when they found that no Germans were left. I uh, was just going to add that sub that they captured is now on display in a museum in Chicago. Yes. So if you if anybody wants to go see it, learn more about that battle, or get a chance to tour around a German U-boat, it's at the Chicago Museum of Science. So.
Darius Harden, John Baslow, uh, Medal of Honor recipient during World War II in the Pacific. Um, how many, uh, I know probably all of y'all have heard of Band of Brothers. Have any of y'all uh, heard of The Pacific? It's also an HBO miniseries, kind of like that. Yeah, so Gunners Harden, John Baslow is featured in The Pacific, um, and that it's a pretty cool thing to watch. So if you want kind of more uh, about him, that'd be something cool to see. So he was born in uh, November 4th, 1916 in Buffalo, New York. He enlisted in the Marine Corps in 1940. Uh, after completing recruit training and everything, he was sent to Guantanamo Bay, and following that, he was sent out to Guadalcanal, where, uh, where he, he performed the actions, where he got the Medal of Honor. Um, so on Guadalcanal, uh, after the initial uh, United, <coughs> Allied invasion of it, um, the Japanese were trying to push back and recapture what they had lost. Um, one very important part of the Guadalcanal was Henderson Field. It was an airfield that the Americans had captured from the Japanese, and the Japanese had tried to recapture it twice already. Um, the third time around <coughs> is where uh, John uh, Gunnar Sergeant Baslund's uh, actions that earned him the Medal of Honor occurred. Uh, so that's the Medal of Honor citation. I'll leave that up there for you to peruse while I talk about his actions. Um, so, about 3,000 Japanese forces were, uh, were attacking the position where, uh, at the time, Sergeant Baslund's uh, unit was. Uh, Sergeant Baslund was in charge of two machine gun sections, and uh, it was a three-day battle. After the first day of the battle, one of the sections that Sergeant Baslund was in charge of uh, was, was gone. There was only one section left. After, after the second day of the battle, there only remained Sergeant Baslund and two other Marines. Um, and at that time, uh, the line was getting kind of, not, not getting kind of thin, it was getting very thin. Um, and Sergeant Basilow saw that there was a specific point where if he could get suppressing fire at that point, it would keep the Japanese from overrunning the position. Um, so Sergeant Basilow single-handedly uh, ran through continuous enemy fire, got to that point, repaired the uh, machine gun that he had with him, under fire because it was broken, he couldn't even lay down any fire himself, and single-handedly <laughs> made that machine gun uh, and kept the Japanese off of their position for that time. Um, towards the end of the second day, um, they ran out of supplies at the uh, position that he was at, him and two other Marines that were with him. And not only were they out of supplies, but they had also been cut off from their supply lines. Um, they had no ammunition for their machine guns, the Japanese had encircled them, and Things were not looking good for them. Um, when they did run out of ammunition, Sergeant Baslow single-handedly held off the Japanese coming towards them with his handgun. And following that, he broke through Japanese lines to get back to where American forces were to get supplies with his handgun only. Um, after he did that, he was able to get ammunition back to his, uh, his, his men that he was with, and they were able to hold the line uh, and not let the Japanese capture Henderson Field. Uh, by the end of the battle, uh, Sergeant Baslow was credited with 38 confirmed kills, um, and he was awarded the Medal of Honor for his actions throughout the three-day battle. Um, after, after he got the Medal of Honor back in uh, Washington, D.C., he went on a trip around, um, around the country selling war bonds. It's a big deal during World War II, uh, you know, stirring up public support for the war, getting money to fund the war effort, and they, they wanted a face, and Sergeant Baslow was a great face for that, because he was a face that everyone at the time knew. Um, his actions were publicized in every newspaper in the country. Um, however, after he, he went back home stateside, uh, he realized selling war bonds is not what he wanted to do. He wanted to be back in the fight just like he was in Guadalcanal. So eventually, um, he returned to, to the Pacific Theater uh, at Iwo Jima, and at Iwo Jima, um, before he got there, he was uh, he was promoted gunnery sergeant, and he was training uh, platoon recruits at uh, in San Diego for the Marine Corps. And when when they were done with their training, uh, they were going to keep him stateside. He said, "No, I want to go. Uh, I want to go with him to the Pacific." His famous quote is, "I'm staying with my boys." Um, and he went over them to the Pacific and led them during the. Uh, amphibious assault on Iwo Jima. Uh, during the amphibious assault on Iwo Jima, about two hours into battle, 
Um, Gunner Sergeant Basil and his and his uh, platoon were were continuing to move in from the beaches, um, and he was killed by mortar fire. Uh, he was awarded the Navy Cross for his actions at Iwo Jima. So takeaways from this: uh, first of all, obviously, is courage um, in battle. Both in Guadalcanal and Iwo Jima, very famous battles that the Marine Corps has been in. Um, Sergeant Baslow and then later Gunnery Sergeant Baslow showed extreme courage um, that is not can't be topped. Pretty much, there, there, there's there's no way to go above and beyond what he did. And he should set an example for all of us. You know, right now we're in an academic setting, and you know we're not showing courage in battle every day while we're here. But if you think about it, there, there's a possibility that the time comes that we're going to have to do that when we're out there leading sailors and marines. So we always need to be prepared for that and be ready to show that courage and lead from the front. Uh, second thing is selflessness. Um, during the Battle of Guadalcanal, uh, Guadalcanal uh, defending Henderson Field, uh, got Sergeant Bazalone, you know, he didn't say, oh, I'm in charge. You Marines, uh, go over there and do that. You go over do that. Go under fire. I'll stay back here. Uh, no, he he didn't think of himself first and his safety. He went and did the dangerous things himself. He put himself into danger for the betterment of other of other people to keep them safe. Um, that's something that we can all take to heart. And when we're leading people, that will definitely earn a lot of their respect and their loyalty uh, when we're doing that. If we lead in a selfless way. And finally, commitment. Uh, Navy Marine Corps core value. Um, his famous quote, I'm staying with my boys. He wasn't, he didn't, you know, just do what he did on Guadalcanal and say, I'm done with this. Uh, he, he didn't just say, well, I'm going to stay at home in America and, you know, chill out for the rest of the war. He wanted to go back and finish the job. He was committed to finishing the job. And we should all, even in an academic setting, setting like this, we can take that to heart and know that whatever job we have before us, whether it's a test or one of those stupid UNC cleanups that we have to do, Stay there and finish the job. Have commitment to it because we're going to be in the Navy Marine Corps. That's that's important. Questions? Thank you. We got the new battalion. First Class Lockhart, today I'm going to be talking to you about Medal of Honor recipient, Second Lieutenant John Bazin. For this, as, as you are, Second Lieutenant John Bobo. John is a popular name. Alright, so, for those of you that have been to OCS, and those of you that are going to OCS, Second Lieutenant John Bobo is a very important name. He, the Chow Hall at OCS bears his name, and today you're going to find out why. Alright, Second Lieutenant Bobo, he was born in 1943 in Niagara Falls, New York. He was described as a kid as a small kid with a lot of heart. He tried out for all the high school teams, didn't make them and say he was too skinny. That pissed him off. So he went, started lifting, got bigger, started making the teams. All right, this carried over into his Marine Corps career. All right, he graduated OCS and TBS in 1966. He hit the fleet. He was described as a quiet, competent, and caring second lieutenant. Then, in 1966, he deployed to Quang Tri Province in South Vietnam, the 3rd Battalion, 9th Marine Division. All right, so, that is Quang Tri, is this area here, west of Kong Tien, south of the demilitarized zone, and near Khe Sanh, another important Marine Corps battle. All right. So, now Vietnam in 1967 was not a very hospitable place. All right. So, before we get any further, I need you to do something for me. All right. So, every Vietnam movie you've seen, you know, what's, the, what's the thing you see in every Vietnam movie? Or you hear? It's raining. Is it raining? Yeah, it's always <laughs> raining. Close, not what I'm looking for. Yeah. Helicopters. Yes. <laughs> Great, give me the correct answers. All right, so what I'm saying is think a little bit outside the box. All right, I want you to think of your favorite Vietnam War song, all right? Now you got C CCR, Rolling Stones. Get that in your head and it's crime of Vietnam, all right? All right, so regular combat troops deployed to Vietnam first in 1965. Now, special forces have been operating in Vietnam for years before that, but regular combat troops were not until 1965. All right, Vietnam was characterized by the use of combined action platoons, otherwise known as CAP units, 
Right, these were uh, platoons of American forces combined with South Vietnamese forces that were designed to win the hearts and minds of the Vietnamese people. They placed these in small hamlets and villages so the two uh, nations would work together to provide security. Right, also, so to destroy tactics, very self-explanatory. Don't, don't think too hard about it. Right, also, jungle warfare. So, a little personal story about my great uncle was a Marine in Vietnam. So I'm going to describe to you a little bit about what he describes to me uh, as jungle warfare. Disclaimer though, when he described this to me, he had had a few. That's the, only, that's the only reason he even talked about it. So, the Viet Cong, that's the paramilitary forces of the North Vietnamese. They, you could not eat meat before a patrol. The Viet Cong could smell the meat on your breath. You could not take a shower before you went on patrol. The Viet Cong could smell the soap, right? You could not, either your canteen was all the way full or it was all the way empty because they could hear the sloshing for hundreds of yards. Right, so that's jungle warfare. Right? As Bishop Zucky mentioned before, helicopters came into a greater use in Vietnam than they started in Korea, but Vietnam is where they really found their place and they, you see them in all the movies. Uh, what they then allowed is for forces to be quickly and precisely positioned into a fighting position. Right? Now on the home front in 1967, Vietnam was not a very popular place. Right? The Vietnam War, as you probably already know, was not a very popular uh, decision in the eyes of the public. But none of this mattered to say Lieutenant John Bobo on March 30th, 1967. His platoon was tasked with setting up a night ambush position in the Quang Tri province when they were, after they set up their amb ambush position, they were ambushed. Right? They were in space with superior forces, uh, they were surprised, so call guard, the so second lieutenant, John Bobo, moved into position to support two rocket teams who had been pinned down. So this, and this, this did, he single-handedly was holding off the entire enemy force from overrunning his men. All right, as he was doing this, a mortar round exploded, severing his leg from the knee down. All right, now you think, most people, that would stop him. No, this pissed Second ten, John Bobo off. Right, so what he did, he took his web belt. Everybody knows what a web belt is. Pretty thick belt. Takes that, tourniquets his leg, takes his leg, rubs it in the dirt to, call the, to attempt to stop the bleeding. Has the corpsman who tries to evacuate him, tells the corpsman, no, I'm staying. Has him prop up, props himself up against the tree, is given a shotgun, and holds off enemies so his men can uh, move back to a safer position. Right? So, after this, he's, he's, he's killed while doing this. But his actions inspired the rest of his men to launch a successful counterattack. So, what we can learn, you can take away the warrior ethos. Right? He never stopped fighting. He lost, his, lost half his leg, and he's still out there fighting. He stuck his bloody leg, what was left of his leg, and stuck it in the dirt. I know some of us won't even get in the dirt when we're not injured, so maybe take a little bit of a lesson from this. And then, Second Lieutenant John Bobo knew it was never about him, and as such, it is never about us. The only reason he tourniqueted his leg, the only reason he attempted self-preservation, was to cover the movement of his men. All right? Are there any questions? You can't read this on the back of this Marines. Black jacket, it says, caution, being a Marine in Quezon may be hazardous to your health. 3rd Battalion, 26 Marines, that's quoted from Newsweek. And this is a view from the top of Quezon. So, any questions? Thank you. about Johnny Kilmer. He's a corpsman in the Navy and he received the Medal of Honor. Um, does any, before we start, does anyone know how old the youngest or Medal of Honor recipient was? Eleven. Eleven, yeah, you got it. All right, does anyone know how old Johnny Kilmer was when he received the Medal of Honor? Sixteen. All right, no, none of those. Uh, he's 21. So just kind of, as Sergeant Major said before, keep in mind that even though these people are so young, they can make a difference no matter what age they are. All right, so getting into it. 
Before we start this slide, uh, I'm going to tell you about his story, how he received the Medal of Honor, what he changed in the Navy, and a couple of traits that I think his active valor really shows, and how we can incorporate those into our lives to just better ourselves in the organization like the battalion. All right, so his story. So Johnny Kilmer dropped out of high school at 17 uh, to become a corpsman in the Navy. And after this, he, after his training, getting his um, all his quals for the corpsman, uh, he was assigned to the USS Response at the beginning of the Korean War in 1950. So after his time on the USS Response, it was kind of the middle of the Korean War now, and he was up for re-enlistment in 1952 where he decided to go to the Fleet Marine Forces, FMF, and he did his training, his combat training there, um, and then was on his way to Korea. So that leads us to August 13, 1952, where Johnny Kilmer received his Medal of Honor um, and where he also lost his life. So here, um, before we go over this slide, uh, I just want to say that normally when there's a Medal of Honor citation, we'd all be standing at attention um, out of respect for the Medal of Honor citation itself, uh, but today we're not going to do that. It's just a short piece, so I just kind of want to let everyone know. Um, so here is where I really see what embodied that day uh, and what he gave. I'll just read this to you guys. So Kilmer skill skillfully administered first aid to his comrade, and as another mounting barrage of enemy fire shattered the immediate area, unhesitatingly shielded the wounded man with his own body. So. On this day, um, Johnny Kilmer went out uh, through enemy fire to expedite the care for one of his Marines. And unfortunately, a mortar came down and um, he heard it coming, so he threw himself over this injured Marine to save his life. Um, and this is where he lost his life unselfishly. So, on to the next slide changing foreman. So, this is what he kind of changed in the Navy through this act of valor. Um, here is another quote by a technician um, at Corman School, and it really goes to show kind of what they believe in and how he changed this. So we say celebrating his sacrifice because he embodies exactly what we stand for. Uh, that was really powerful to me. It shows that he is what they believe all of them should be. Rendering care to others before oneself. So again, that's how he went about changing foreman and the Navy in general. So now, kind of going back to that active valor, when I read that, I really thought of two things, uh, devotion and selflessness. So these two quotes can really be, sh like he shows both of them. And um, so we'll start with devotion. So devotion, when I kind of think about it, um, I think of devotion as you're, you have a passion and a care for something. And this devotion, he showed by giving his life for one of his comrades. He went and put himself in the position of enemy fire to expedite care for one of his comrades. Um, he had a passion for being a corpsman and a passion for caring for those among him. And again, um, devotion leads to perseverance and he was successful in this attempt at caring for his comrade. Next, uh, selflessness. So, <coughs> giving his life for something bigger than himself and a cause greater that he may have not understood at the time um, is definitely selfless. And selflessness goes a long way in strengthening the organization and not just yourself as a person. So, keep that in mind as we go on the next slide. So what can we do as midshipmen to show these traits? So devotion, although we may not be in a strenuous situation, even though you may think tests are hard or something, but um, if you develop a devotion to getting your commission, getting your degree, or passing the next test, passing the next PRT, you definitely will persevere. But you have to have that devotion. So make sure that the next time you're just oriented to doing something, you're devoted to it, and you'll persevere. The next, uh, be selfless. So you've all heard Ms. Bushman say, be approachable. I think that this kind of goes hand in hand with being approachable. Um, so being selfless, or being personable, excuse me. Um, 
being personal and being selfless, giving your time to another midshipman who may need help, giving your time to an about the battalion when they may when they may need an event filled, is uh, selfless in kind of like a way that we can show this. So although you may not be able to give your life to something, you can definitely give your time, even though it may cause some slight inconvenience to you. And this will go a long way in strengthening the battalion and maybe another midshipman that you may be helping out. So um, outside of the battalion, now, again, you've heard this plenty of times, now is the time that you need to try things, try things out before you hit the fleet so you don't look like a moron. Um, and practicing devotion and selflessness will go a long way if you start it now when you get to the fleet. So takeaways from this brief, Johnny Kilmer gave the ultimate sacrifice for his country and something bigger than himself. He modeled selflessness and devotion, and we should try and incorporate these two traits into our daily lives of midshipmen so that we can better ourselves when we get to the fleet. Are there any questions? Thank you.